This video is brought to you by our amazing supporters over at Patreon. Hey everyone, it's Ben from board to bits and in this video we're going to be covering the transform, the boring little component that appears at the top of every game object. If you've worked in Unity at all, you're probably familiar with the fact that the transform handles the position, rotation, and scale of a game object. Slightly less obvious is the fact that it also handles how the object relates in the hierarchy, whether it's a parent or child to any other game objects. But Transform has a lot more than that to offer. There are variables, properties, and methods that can save you time and give you advanced functionality within your game. And so I wanted to cover some of those today. I'm going to break up this video into a few different sections and I'll include some um, links in the description so that you can jump around if you want to, but hopefully you find most if not all of this stuff to be new information or at least very useful to you. One quick note, the classes you're going to see here are really just for demo purposes, so I'm not going to get into how to write the entire classes you'll see. I will describe how different methods work when those are relevant. I will include all of these files in a link down in the description, so if you want to kind of dig into them and see how they work on a little bit deeper level, feel free to do that and check those out. So the first thing I want to cover in this video is the fact that transforms can refer to their values in two different ways, and that's either in their local space or in their global space. And it's important to understand the difference between these two. If a game object has no parent or its parent's transform is just set to the default, then there's actually no difference between these. The position and rotation and scale in their local space is equivalent to the global space. However, if a parent has been offset in any way, then that can start to change those values dramatically, and it's important, again, to understand how those are changing. So it's also a little bit confusing because what's appearing in the inspector isn't necessarily what we would think if you looked at what the names of the variables are. The position, rotation, and scale here are in local space. Whereas if you typed in transform dot position, you would actually be getting the global space position for that. And I can show you how that works um, with this cube um, demo that we have here. I've got this values class script on it. And all that this does is it prints out what the local variables and the global variables are for the transform. So I can hit play and we can see that now. And what we'll see here is that local position, which is printed as transform dot local position, is one, two, three, which is in fact what we have here in the inspector for position one, two, three. Our local rotation in Euler angles, 30, 60, 45, is likewise here. And our local scale is one, 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 which appears here. Now, local scale is actually really important because Unlike rotation and position, which you can kind of interchangeably change their local values and their global values as long as you understand which space you're working in, scale doesn't work in the same way. Local scale you can change normally, however its global um, companion, which is actually called lossy scale, is A, cannot be changed in code, it's a read-only value, and B, it actually gets dramatically changed if you if you have a parent that's been rotated or scaled, things like that, it becomes very difficult to work with. So scale is something you have to really be careful for. That's why it's important if you have like a character model or something that has a parent, you don't wanna change that parent's scale. Ideally, you don't wanna change any of the values of the um, rotation or scale on that because then that's gonna change how that child works and looks. So, but what we can do is take a look here at the code and understand now that these are getting um, the same, because there is no parent, these are getting the same values. We have local position that is the same as global position, local rotation is the same as global rotation, etc. The other thing that's important to look at here is that there's a local rotation and then I have a local rotation E. The E means Euler angles, which is when you're working with a vector three, that's Euler angles, which are on an X, Y, and Z axis. If you just get transform.rotation, you're actually working in quaternions, which is this four value number, which is technically better for rotation because it doesn't run into some of the issues that vector threes can, but it's also a lot more complicated to understand. So it's just important to understand that there is this separate variable. In fact, I'll jump over to the code and show you that you have local rotation, and this is the one that's in a quaternion. In fact, it'll show you it returns a quaternion there. And then you have local Euler angles, which is the same essentially thing. It's getting that rotation, but it's in a vector three, so it's a lot easier to work with. And likewise for rotation, there's rotation, which is the global value, and then Euler angles, which is the global 
rotation but in, in vector 3. So those are the two important things to know. Difference of local versus global and the fact that rotation is actually in quaternions and that there's this Euler angles version as well. And finally, with scale, you cannot actually edit the global scale, only um, read it. So we understand that a transform has local values and global values, and it's easy enough to get both of those from the transform. But what if we have, say, like a separate object out in the world that isn't related to our transform, it isn't a parent or a child, but we want to kind of see how it relates in, say, local space to our transform. Well, fortunately, there's a few different methods that Unity provides in the transform class that allow us to do this. Let's say, for example, we have a character that can throw a ball three units ahead of itself. And we want to know where that position would be. We know locally that's three units forward, but what does that mean in global terms? What if we are moved? What if we're rotated? You know, how does that change? So we can do that by using what's called the transform point. So I'll jump over to our um, mono develop here. We see that I've got this local world class for converting from local to world space. And I've got a, I'm, what I'm setting a vector three destination. And so in this case, like I said, if it's forward three units, that would be vector three, zero, zero, three. And I'm going to calculate a few different things from this. I'm going to calculate a point, which is using transform point to that destination. I'm also going to do a transform vector to the destination as well as a transform direction, and we'll see what each of those means. So we've got our cube that this is our cube. It is um, a pretty basic cube. It is up in the air three units, and it is scaled one and one on the x and y axes, but it's actually scaled halfway to 0.5 on the z axis, that forward axis, and that's going to be important, and we'll see why in a minute. And then I've got our local world class script on here with destinations. Uh, with the destination of 003, so three units ahead of it. We'll hit play and we'll see what happens here. I've set it up so that basically the gizmos will draw. The point is in cyan, the um, vector is magenta, and then the direction is um, yellow. So these are all doing three different things now, and why is that? Why is that the case? Well, the first one, the point, is a position. Relative, it's getting the world position relative to the position of our um, transform. So what happens is it takes the point th or the three forward that we have here, and it looks at the position of the transform, the cube in this case, and it says, okay, go three forward from that position, which is why it's up in the air. However, it's also affected by the scale, this z.5, which is why it's actually only going about one and a half units forward. If I kind of move this this way, you'll see along here, it's one and a half forward and then directly above the magenta one here. So that's why that's appearing there. The magenta one, which we said is that transform vector, does the same thing, but it doesn't take the position into account. It's just getting you the pure vector from zero, zero, zero even if I were to move this, you know, to the left, it wouldn't follow it. Like if I, well, here, let me reset this, move this over here and hit play. You see that the blue one follows the position, but the magenta doesn't care. It only is giving me that vector. However, it is still impacted by that Z value. Finally, direction doesn't care about position or the um, scale. It just gives you that pure value. This is really useful. Say you're using something where you have, you just want like a normalized vector that always has a magnitude of one and you don't want it to get affected by any scaling or anything. So you're always getting a pure kind of, a pure direction that isn't being um, stretched or squashed or anything. That's why um, transform direction is very useful there. The other thing that I can show you with this turn this off for a second, is that not only does it follow the position properly and the direct and the um, facing, but if I like rotate this, say, kind of toward the camera here and we hit play, now we see that all three of them also follow, while these two here in particular are still at zero, zero, zero as their origin, they're definitely following the rotation of the transform that's their target. And so that gives you, again, that pure vector or pure direction so that if you say had a character that was again throwing a ball, you could give it, you could pass in that information and then use say physics to say, okay, go in that direction, but give it whatever force you need to. 
In addition to this, say you had a character that wanted to teleport to a point, but needed to know its local value. Um, so say you had, you know, this, you say you actually had a destination off in the distance and you didn't know like locally how far away it was from you, you could get the inverse of that by saying uh, vector three inverse equals transform dot inverse transform point, or this similarly you could get the direction or the vector, and what that would do is convert whatever the world position of your target is to local space for you. If you were at 0, 0, 1, say, and there was an object at 0, 0, 3, you could inverse transform that point and find out that it was actually two units above you. And that's how you convert points, vectors, and directions from local space to world space. The next thing I want to talk about are three properties of a transform called up, right, and forward. These are really useful because what they give you are the local axes of an object. For example, if I show you this cube here and I go to the arrows, you'll see the up, the uh, right, move this properly here, up, right, and forward axes. And no matter how you rotate or move this object, it will always give you where those arrows are pointing, which can be very useful in a number of cases. In this example here, what I've got are, I've got a few small cubes that are going to be positioned so that they'll always follow those faces. This could be important if you had like a targeting reticle or something that you always wanted to keep kind of aligned to a character. You can do that and it doesn't even necessarily need to be childed to, or parented to the um, target object. You can always get that information. So we'll see this one in action here. And we see that we have these three cubes that appear at up, uh, right, and forward. And even when we rotate this around, no matter how we rotate it, those cubes always follow uh, those faces. In addition, though, this is a useful thing, but what I think is particularly useful is the fact that up, right, and forward are actually settable, too. I'm going to go into our second scene here. And here we have these are now actually just childed to the cube so that they will always turn around. But what you can do is you can have something set up so that no matter... Um, Whenever you give it a particular vector or axis to follow, the um, target, the transform, will align itself to that appropriate axis as you want it to. So in this case here, I've got this cube and I've got it set up where it is always going to face this sphere on whichever axis I want, whether it's the up, the right, or the forward axis. So we'll start with the up axis, which is this blue one here. If I go back to um, the... Uh, movement gizmo, you can see that that's the y-axis there. And when I hit play, what happens is it automatically snaps itself to face that sphere, and we're always going to be rotating to follow that sphere's face, the, um, so that the facing is always pointing at the sphere. There is a method that I'll talk about in a little bit that can also do this. But um, this actually gives you a little bit more flexibility because in this case, right now we're doing it with dot up. In fact, I'll jump into the code here for a second for you. And you can see that right now, because we're set to facing dot up, it's using it on the transform up. You can also do it with the right and the forward and um, the method always does, does it with the transform dot forward. Um, so let's see here now, if I go to say transform dot right and hit play, We'll see that here now we can again rotate and sure enough it always follows that same. Um, now the right is always facing that cube. We can even go all the way around here. So using that up, right, and forward you can not only get what that axis is but you can actually set that which can be useful for things where you say you need something to snap to the ground or snap to a wall. You can immediately um, affect the facing of your transform to follow some other um, facing that you want. In this next section, I want to discuss the variety of different methods that Unity provides to be able to modify the values of the transform. It's not just limited to um, saying transform.position equals or transform.localrotation equals something. You can actually use some different methods to get different effects and to do things a little bit more efficiently. 
So for this one, I'm not actually going to be showing a lot of examples in the scene view. I just want to kind of show you the code so that you can see what these methods look like and how they work. So first off, for changing um, position, there are a few different um, variations of a method called translate. Now the first one here is transform.translate, and you simply pass in a uh, vector3 of some sort. Now what's important about this, this is different from setting the position because instead of setting it specifically to a position, you're actually, in this case, um, you're going to be moving it by that vector. So if you said, vec in this case here, vector3 forward, it would move forward one unit. It's also important to note that this defaults to local space, which means that if your, if your transform is facing a different direction, it's actually going to move forward in the direction it's facing, not based on the world space. Now there is a way that you can do it in world space, which is you can add in a space argument, which is either self, but if you put self, it's essentially equivalent to doing this, or you can say world. So in this case here, now it would move forward on the global z-axis. Finally, there's translate with a um, transform in the, um, in the argument as the second argument. In this case, what it does, it's kind of similar, it, it'll be the, but it'll be the local space of whatever transform you put in there. So if you're facing one way, but the target transform is facing a different way, you're actually going to move forward as the target transform sees the forward in the world. So those are translate, and that's how those work. Next up is set position and rotation. This is just really a slightly more efficient way that you can set both the position and rotation in one line. To be honest though, in most cases you're going to be somehow calculating position and rotation separately anyway. So I find that just doing transform.position and transform.rotation is usually easier and a little bit clearer, but this is, there is a way that you can do it here. And just of note with this, you have to supply a vector three for the position, but a quaternion for the rotation. And I did want to talk about one thing here, which is that if you say like in this situation where it requires a quaternion, but you're used to working in vector threes, you can always get a quaternion from a vector three by doing quaternion dot Euler and then passing in the vector three that you want. That will convert that to a quaternion for you. It is worth noting that that won't always have the exact um, results because you're kind of putting that into the black box of the um, of the method here. You might not get the exact results you're, you thought you were going to, um, but at least in that way you can get a quaternion relatively easily. Next up is transform.rotate and this does pretty much what it says. It, However, it is important to note that it's rotating an amount, it's not going to a rotation, it's actually physically rotating the object by the amount that you say. Um, so if you were if you had an object that was kind of off kilter and you wanted to get it to zero zero zero, you couldn't just say transform.rotate zero zero zero. You would need to tell it to rotate back to that or simply set its rotation. So there's a few ways you can do this. You can say rotate and then pass in a vector three. Though it's very important to note here that the order that it, it's not in this order that it will rotate these. It'll actually start on the z-axis and rotate that first, then it will rotate the x-axis and then the y. The somewhat crude and stupid way that I remember this is zexy, um, but it's, I mean, it's a bizarre word, but it easily reminds you that z first, then x, then y. And that can be important because if you rotate in certain ways sometimes, it can actually kind of lock up other axes. It's called gimbal lock. Um, and so it's important to note that this one's happening first, then the x, then the y. Um, this also defaults to your local axes. So if you, again, want to make it um, rotate on the world's axes, you need to use rotate and um, pass in the vector three and then say space.world. You can also put space.self here, but again, it's just equivalent to this. In addition, there are two um, other ways that you can rotate. The first is you can just pass in three floats and it will treat this as the same way as this. It will actually kind of create the vector three for you and then treat it as this. It will still, I believe, go in Z, X, Y order in this case. And then finally, what you can do is you can rotate, instead of rotating on all three axes, you can set a particular axis that you want to rotate on and it doesn't have to be um, a particular, like a, like a um, coordinate one, like up, 
right or forward, you can use any axis that you want. You can have it tilted slightly to one side, things like that. And then you can tell it how many degrees you want it to rotate by. So if you wanted to simulate the planet rotating, you might do it by something that's slightly off of um, straight up and then rotate it from there. And once again, here in these two, it will be in local space unless you specify otherwise. Transform.rotate around lets you, it's not really rotating in my opinion, it's really more of an orbiting experience because what happens is that you choose a point somewhere in the world, which is this first uh, vector three, and that's in global space. That's not relative to your object that is specifically in, um, in the world space. So if you say, 0, 0, 0, that's going to be the origin of the world, not the origin of your transform. Then you choose an axis, kind of similar to how this works, where you're going to choose an axis against which you want to rotate, and then finally you give it an angle of how much you want to rotate. What's interesting about this is that not only will it kind of, it'll orbit around the object, but it will also rotate so that it's always, whichever face was facing that point to begin with, will stay kind of, on, kind of in a geosynchronous orbit all the way around. Next we have transform look at, and you can either give it a transform to look at, which it will get the position of that transform, or you can just give it a specific vector three position to look at, look at itself, or to look at for the transform to look at. Um, of note with this one, this one is a little bit different um, in two ways from when we were setting the, the uh, transform dot forward to a particular position. And that's because this will always be forward you can't have it you can't have the top of something point to something or the side of it pointed it will always be the face the forward looking face will always point at the transform or the vector 3 that you set um, likewise this will always attempt to if it can and it um, it will always attempt to stand up straight after doing this so if you um, don't want that extra rotation in there um, then you would need to find a different way to rotate this. So it'll always kind of, and you can set that, what you what what standing quote unquote upright looks like. In this case here, we're saying it's vector three up. And I think it defaults to a world, um, kind of that up Y axis, but that basically lets you, so you could say, you know, if you did want it to be on its side or something, you could set that to vector three dot right. And then it would look at the target transform and then try to tilt itself as long as it was legal to do so and still looking at the target transform, it would try to tilt itself so that it was standing quote unquote upright with vector three dot right being um, up in this case, which is probably more confusing than it sounds like, but I just encourage you to kind of um, take out this line if you want and kind of experiment with it and you'll see how this affects um, the final positioning of your transform. Lastly, when you're doing changes like these, there's actually a variable within a transform called has changed that will tell you whether or not um, there have been changes made to the transform, funny enough. However, it's also worth noting that this never actually resets itself. So if you ever want to double check, like check again after a while and see if the transform has changed, you need to be sure to manually reset it back to false. Otherwise, it will just stay, once one change has made to, been made to it, it will ch has changed, will remain true for eternity. Um, there is also, according to Unity's documentation, they say that if you set something but don't actually change it, so say you had a cube at 0, 0, 1, and then you set it to 0, 0, 1, that has changed would become true, even though there's not actually been a change. It just checks that something, that a, that a set call has been made. Um, in my experience, I haven't seen that to be the case. I tried a few different ways of resetting um, the transform and it still came up as false when I didn't actually change the values, but that is a thing they say in there, so just be advised about that as well. You could get a false positive um, in, that, in that respect. So those are a number of different ways to change the values um, within your transform without just directly setting the position, rotation, or scale and they can give you some additional um, functionality within those as well. Finally, let's talk about some different ways that you can modify the hierarchy using the transform and some methods within that. 
Finally, let's talk about the hierarchy and how you can modify it using some methods within the transform. Um, you'll notice I have a bunch of different scenes here, and that's just because when dealing with the hierarchy, obviously each scene represents a hierarchy, and so as we're going to be messing around with it, I'm going to have to kind of switch to some clean slates here. So the first thing you can do with the transform is to parent one object to another. In this case here, I've got this attached parent script on my cube, and I've got this parent that will be the target, um, which will become the parent. Now there's two ways to do this, and let's jump into Modern Develop to take a look here. And the two ways are you can either just directly set transform.parent, or you can use the set parent method. And there's not a whole lot of difference between these, but there is one thing that you can do that's kind of interesting, which is in this world position stays boolean that you'll see there. So let's see how that works in action. So first off here, we're just gonna do this normally, or quote unquote normally, by just setting the parent value. If we do this, what we'll see here that happens is that we hit play and the cube becomes a parent, or becomes a child rather, of the parent, but you'll notice especially if I turn this off for a second here, that the cube at this point is at negative four, zero. It doesn't move in the scene, but you'll also notice that its value here changes because now it's, now it's based on the local space of the parent, which is up here at four positive, so that's why it's now at negative four, negative four, zero. But it doesn't actually change its global position. Likewise, even if we use the set parent method, it would default, set parent defaults to this world positioning stays, which has the same effect. We hit play, the cube becomes a child of the parent, but it doesn't change its position. It's only when you specifically say use set parent method and this world position stays is false. So what we're doing here is saying set parent, the parent, and we're specifically saying false now because that box is unchecked. that when we hit play now, suddenly the child moves because it's maintaining that same negative four, zero, zero position, but now it's in the parent's local space. So if you want to keep your um, local position constant and you want it to you know, kind of snap to whatever new parent it has in that position, then you want to use set parent with world position stays as false. Next, let's take a look at how to manage children with a parent object. So here in this example, we have a parent with six children, and one of those children has three children of its own. So we can do a number of things now as a parent here. We can get a child, we can check children's indices, and we can um, determine if something is a child of something else. Let's jump into Monodevelop and look at this new script here, Child Check. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm manually setting a child from one of my children and a grandchild from one of those three grandchildren objects. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to check on those and say, first off, this actually doesn't use these. This first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get a child based on an index. So it's gonna kind of iterate through the children, find the proper index and pull that one. We can check the sibling index, meaning that if we say, look at our child and say, where do you fall within your siblings? It will look at itself and figure that out and give you an integer based on that. And then likewise, we can, we're gonna check on the object itself, the parent object, one of the children, the direct children, and one of the grandchildren to see what happens when we check, are these children of um, this main parent object? So let's hit play and see what happens here. Go over to the console, and we see that first thing we did was we got the child at zero, index zero. So in this case, we just looked through the hierarchy, went, oh, zero index here, got the child, and sure enough, its name is child zero. The next thing we did was we looked at, I had set the child variable here to child two, and we got the index of it, so it went through and went, uh, which, which index is it? Zero, one, two, child two is at index two. Next, we start checking are things children. And this is where it gets a little bit interesting because the parent, it turns out when you check, is, is a parent a child of itself? Yes, it is. And any object is considered a child of itself. Next, we checked is child two here, a child of the parent. And that makes sense, sure enough. Child two is um, a child of the parent. 
And finally, we checked is the grandchild, and this is what's considered a deep child because it's multiple children levels in, and likewise, that one also comes up true. Pretty much anything in a hierarchy that's below a given parent will always come up as a child. And that's really because what this is also considered, this parent here, is really the root of this hierarchy. And so if you look back in Monodevelop, we also see that we have this check of root, and we're looking at the grandchild's root. And root always goes and basically says, what is my parent? Does that parent have a parent? Yes. Does that parent have a parent? In this case, no, it doesn't. So that must be the top thing in the hierarchy. That is the root. So in this case, the root is parent. But in the same, in a similar way that everything here has the same root, anything that's a child of something in at any level will always return true for is child of. Last little thing I want to talk about in here is a method called detach children. And what that will do is it will detach all the children directly under a parent. If, there are, if those children have their own grandchildren, that, those hierarchies will remain intact, but the parent-child connection at that first level will be detached for all children. We can see that in action here. Now that I've uncommented that, we can hit play. And I probably didn't actually save it. Nope. But now we see that the children get separated from the parent. They are no longer connected. However, child five's children are still underneath it. It is also worth noting that these kind of get cast um, all throughout the hierarchy. So do bear in mind if you um, don't have, if you aren't keeping track of those some other way, they may be kind of all over the place in there. Next, we'll look at siblings and a few things that you can do by actually affecting a um, sibling's position among other siblings. This is really more, a little bit more in the weeds and something you probably won't need on a day-to-day -day basis, but can be useful if you're, um, you know, say perhaps using the order of children to determine how to um, run a certain aspect of your game or something like that. This can be useful to do. So I've got a script here. I called it sibling rivalry because I am super clever. And basically there are three methods you can use for this. There is set as first sibling, which will, as it sounds, set a particular object to be the very first sibling in the hierarchy. There's set as last sibling, which will put it at the end of its siblings in the hierarchy, and then you can actually set it to a specific index. So in here, child three has this rivalry um, component on it, and if I tell it to set it to first and hit play, you will see that it moves up to the top of the hierarchy here. If I set it to last, hit play, it goes to the very end of the hierarchy, and finally, I can also set it specifically to an index. If I say set it to zero, it actually works the same way as set as first, where it goes all the way to the top. But I could move it down one, and it'll only go um, below the zero, but above everything else. And note that everything else will always retain its relative order, one, then two, then four, then five. It doesn't you know, start really shuffling everything else. It just simply takes that one out, pops it in to, and then kind of moves whatever was in that index down one as necessary. And so everything else retains that same relative order. Finally, and this kind of relates to this and is likewise a little bit less, ne um, less frequently used, is that we have um, a few counts that we can get. And um, these are useful, I think, more in optimization really, but are, I wanted to include here because I think they're useful to know. So in this case here, we have a little bit more of an involved hierarchy where we have a parent, six children, three children under one of those, and four further children under that. So we've got about a total of 14 objects here in this hierarchy. The parent, uh, no, not the parent, which one is it? The child, child five has, and it doesn't really matter where you actually put this, um, this script, but I've got this count capacity script can jump in, take a look at this one. And here we're getting three different uh, properties from the transform. First, we're gonna get the child count, then we're gonna get the hierarchy count, and finally, hierarchy capacity. And I'll talk about those one by one. So when we hit play, we'll see that the console prints out a few different things. First off, child count. Child count, unlike is child of, only cares about the very first level. So we see that child count is three because child five has one, two, three children. 
It does not care about the grandchildren, and it obviously doesn't care about its siblings or its parents in that case. Hierarchy count, on the other hand, cares about all of that. It counts everything from the root all the way to every child. So that's why we have 14 here. It's because it's the uh, parent, six children, that's seven, three grandchildren, that's 10, and four great-grandchildren, so total of 14. Likewise, we get a hierarchy capacity. This is the one that's probably the, like I say, really gonna be used more for optimization. And here's how this works. Every time you have anything with a parent-child relationship, or really every time you have a discrete root object in your um, scene, that is its own hierarchy. A single object like this actually has a hierarchy count of one because there's only one thing in it. However, everything larger than that, once you add anything to it, increases that hierarchy count. However, once, once the hierarchy count increases, that means that the capacity also needs to increase because the capacity by default is only ever as large as it needs to be. So if you start with a single object, that's a capacity of one. If you have three objects, it's gonna be a capacity of three. Now, once you add another object to it, Unity is going to t look at that hierarchy, reallocate memory for it, and say, okay, now I've got a capacity of four, five, six, etc. Every time you add something, it's going to reallocate that. So if you want to be a little bit more efficient with your game and you happen to know, say, for example, say you're doing object pooling and you've got a parent that you know is going to have up to 100 objects, never more than 100, but anywhere up to 100 objects, what you can do is you can say, hey, that parent object has a hierarchy capacity right at the start. We're going to set that to 101. It's actually a settable value. And then what that means is that as long as it doesn't go above, above that 101, which I'm saying 100, 100 objects plus the parent, then it will never we need to reallocate that. Whereas if you had just started, left it at one, every single time that the um, count got above the capacity, it would have to reallocate again and again and again. And if you have enough of those things going on, it could start to bog down your game. So just to, like I say, it's not something you're gonna be using every day, but I think it's something that when you get a little bit deeper into levels and you're wanting to really kind of make sure that your game is running as fast as possible, could be a very useful thing. And that is really all of the things that you need to know about the transform. There are, if you look at the documentation, two things I didn't include in here, which are local to world matrix and world to local matrix. That's because I'm honestly not super familiar with matrices. They basically work similar to the transform point and inverse transform point that I spoke about earlier. And in fact, Unity says if you're not familiar with the matrices, just use those methods instead. Um, and it's basically that same idea, but using matrices, which is a whole different way of looking at world space and something, like I say, that I'm not super familiar with, so I didn't want to lead you down the wrong path on those. But other than that, we've really covered everything to know about transforms in this video. So I hope you've um, found it useful. Feel free to go back and rewatch sections if you want to learn a little bit more or rehash anything. Um, but other than that, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.